Welcome to ASI 2018. We're coming to you live from Orlando, Florida, from the Rose and Shingle Creek Resort Hotel Convention Center here in beautiful, sunny Florida. But we've had, every day we've been here, a big thunderstorm. And just before we went live here, the rain literally just poured here. But there's a nice covered walkway between the convention center and the hotel room. So praise the Lord for that. But thank you for joining us as you do each year for ASI. And we have someone really special that we want to go to this evening, a live feed, don't we? We do, absolutely. ASI is not ASI without Mr. Danny Shelton, our president and CEO, and of course his wife, Yvonne Lewis Shelton. And Danny just had open heart surgery. He could not be here, but Dalton just gave us the thumbs he did. up. And I believe we have Danny on a live feed right now there in Southern Illinois in Thompsonville, and we want to go to him now. Thank you, Greg and Jill. Uh, Yvonne, you know, this is the first time since 1985 that I haven't physically been to an ASI convention. I know, and it's a little weird, isn't it? I know, but you know what? We're going to be watching it. Yes, so absolutely. I know people who've been watching it for 25 years or so. I've never been on this end of it. Wasn't my choice. Yes. But praise God, we're here and we're able. We're here at our home, actually, <laughs> in Southern Illinois, right by 3 ABN. So we're going to be watching this program and I just want to praise the Lord for what a miraculous God that he is Amen. right that God we serve. Is so he's such an awesome God mm -hmm. this is day 13 uh -huh. after your surgery mm -hmm. Danny as most of you know had open heart surgery and this mm -hmm. is day 13 and we thank you so much for your prayers because we know that thousands of people around the yes. world have been praying we really, they really have and yes. I, I'm so thankful for that too uh, actually, they let me out as quadruple bypass. Yes. They let me out after four days. So we've been home and I'm kind of getting bored and wanting to do other things. So I'm doing a little bit of writing and <laughs> doing some things and plenty of exercise. Uh, what I told them is, is, I said, how many steps do I need to get in the hospital? They said, well, whatever you can. And I said, well, tell me what the record is. I want to beat it. Oh, you know, my since goodness. I'm not out playing basketball now <laughs> on, on Tuesday night, you know, then I said, well, at least I can compete. You know, this other way. But. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we would absolutely be there if we could. But we, we feel like yes. we're, uh, we are there with you in spirit and we will be watching as well. Absolutely. So once again, thank you so much for all to all of you for your love and your prayers and financial support of 3ABN and ASI. All right. Back to you, Greg and Jill. Amen. Wow. What a great report from Mr. Danny and Dr. Yvonne. That's right. He looks wonderful. And we just join with you in spirit there in Southern Illinois. And thank you at home for your prayers for him and his recovery and for the beginning of this ASI. That's right. I love yeah. ASI. We get too. to come together and see what God is doing in and through people's lives, business people, lay people, church people, joining hands together to help finish the work. And tonight's speaker is Pastor John Bradshaw. Amen. And we love Pastor Bradshaw at 3ABN. He has a heart for God and he's a powerful preacher of the word. So I know you're going to be blessed tonight. That's right. So you like music. We know you do. So let's join song service here on the stage at ASI Orlando, Florida. Amen. I'd invite you to stand with me as we sing our opening hymn, hymn number 371, Lift Him Up. Hymn number 371. We'll be singing the first, second, and third verses together. Lift him up to see that bids you let the dark. Lift him up, this precious Savior. 
Good evening. You may be seated. Welcome to ASI. It's so good to be here this evening. ASI 2018. Andy, who thought we would ever see such a day? Exactly. Ellen White thought we should have been home a long time ago. But long here we are. Air this. But here we are tonight. Andy, why do you come to ASI anyway? Well, you know, the Apostle Paul, who I think wrote Hebrews, admonished us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, particularly as we see the day approaching. And I believe that the day is approaching. So I'm here to fellowship with you all as we see the day approaching. Andy, we have a theme this year, and the theme is business unusual. What does that mean to you? Well, it's interesting. When we met together as a retreat to plan for the theme, um, I was not really catching it. And as it dawned on me, it occurred to me that there are a couple of things that we want to hopefully impart to you before you leave, one of which is business unusual includes examining ourselves. Is there something that we need to do ourselves to be ready and to be um, willing to serve the Lord? Is there something that we need to do ourselves to understand better? And number two, having done that, to go forth and serve the Lord and witness to the best of our abilities. So I believe this will be business unusual. Thank you, Andy. Uh, friends, tonight, we want that you should leave this place under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've been praying that God would bless this convention with the power of the Holy Spirit. The program committee has worked hard and long yes. to prepare the event. But unless our hearts are ready, unless we are willing to open our hearts to the presence of the Holy Spirit, Amen. we could leave this convention the same way that we came in. So tonight, as we open our convention, we've asked Frank Fournier, former president of ASI, joining us here tonight. Thank you, Frank, for coming. We've asked Frank to pray for us, that we would be under the complete influence of the Holy Spirit as we are here together this weekend. Frank? Amen. Shall we bow our heads? Heavenly Father, such a blessing to be here. It's a blessing to see as many people as are here now. We know there's more coming. Father, you've blessed us always in these convocations. It's always been a blessing to come to ASI. So now we can only ask for a double portion of the blessing that we've received in the past so that not only do we get a blessing, we want to be a blessing. We want to leave this place better than when we came. We want, isn't it time, Heavenly Father, that the Holy Spirit should be poured out upon us? We're looking to you. We ask you in this few days that we have together that our focus would be on you and that you would fill us with your spirit. Thank you for hearing our prayer and blessing us. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Andy. Uh, tonight, we're going to share just a little bit about some of the things that will be happening here at convention, get you a little acquainted with some of the things. And I've asked these uh, three ladies to join me here to help me this evening with some of this. Um, so, Naomi. Naomi Jackson is our Vice President for Logistics. Naomi, tell us a little bit about some of the things that will be happening here at the convention this year. Sure. Well, first off, I know that our hotel rooms can sing really comfy, but we want to encourage you to come and fellowship. Come to the meetings. Take the time to go to the exhibit hall. There are so many fantastic ministries and mission-minded businesses that are here as well, and they are there to connect with you. If you pull out your program guide, your convention guide, you can find out all about about where the different um, ministries are located in the exhibit hall and connect with them and figure out where your seminar is going to be. So we just want to encourage you to stay connected throughout this weekend. Now, uh, Naomi, you know, the exhibit hall experience is a little bit unique in that it's a little bit of a dangerous place, you know, because you could walk through that exhibit hall and you could get invited to participate in mission with some of the people that are waiting there to talk with you. So please take advantage of the exhibit hall and allow God to work on your heart as you walk up and down the aisles and as you see these ministries and as you talk to these people. Just let the Lord engage you in some form of, uh, form of mission as well. So we've got seminars happening, right? We've got a great slate of seminars. We have, please take your program guides with you. Do not leave those behind. You'll be looking at those. We want you to choose the seminar that's right for you. We've had uh, a lot of work going to choosing these seminars, so we're glad that they're here tonight, and uh, we're looking forward to that. Now, one of the other things that's happening at this convention is we have Christy here with us tonight. Now, Christy is uh, a new face at ASI in that she has been with us for how many months now? About six months. About six months. And how many of you have seen some of the ASI social media posts? Raise your hand. Have you seen an ASI social media post? Praise the Lord. Thank you to Christy, okay? This is not thank you to me. It's thank you to Christy. Christy has been providing for us the social media presence and communication area. Now, Christy, you're going to be here during the whole convention, right? Yes. That and you're going to be correct. walking around, and what Christy is looking for is opportunities for stories. Yes. You will see me walking around the exhibit halls, the children's program area. I will be a familiar face, hopefully, by the end of this convention. I'll be coming up to you asking for your stories. If I don't come up to you and you have a story, grab me. Um, I love that. So. so we are so thankful to have Christy on board and to have her here at the convention. She'll be sharing social media posts during the convention keeping our family that's not here up to date, and uh, maybe you can go and see your story there. So great. Thank you, Christy, so much. One of the other things that we're doing this year is we're continuing our endeavor to connect with the young professionals. Ranella, tell us just a little bit about what's happening with the young professionals. Yes, it's really exciting this year. We really wanted to engage with the young people that come to ASI in a more intentional way. And so we have a few opportunities for you if you're a young person here this weekend. Uh, the first one, of course, is on Friday, pretty much all day, we will be having a Young Professionals Conference in Sand Lake Level 2. And we have some really powerful speakers, networking opportunities, really great programming if you are in a, if you're a business professional, if you're wanting to start a ministry, if you're an office worker, a teacher, if you're just a young professional in the church, we really want you to come and be there. Um, another thing is that tomorrow night we're going to have a meet and greet after the programming at 9 o'clock. And every morning, starting tomorrow morning, we will be having morning exercise with F5 at 6 to 6.30 for all the crazy morning early birds. Ooh. Is <laughs> and, that just for young professionals? Actually, no. The, oh. the morning exercise is for anyone and everyone. So any okay. fitness level, meet out front of the lobby of this hotel, 6 a.m. You'll see Xi'an in his bright red F5 shirt. Also, if you want more details on everything I just shared, 
go to the ASI Facebook page because we'll be making regular posts about it and we've already posted about it. So hopefully you guys will be there if you're a young professional and morning exercise is for everyone. So hope you're all there. Thank you so much for sharing with us about ASI tonight. God bless you as we continue this convention. We want to take care of just a couple of items right now uh, of introduction. It's our privilege tonight to be able to introduce to you a couple of folks that uh, you may or may not know. And uh, Alex Bryant is the secretary for the North American Division. And uh, he's here tonight standing in for Elder Jackson. You know, it's Elder Jackson's 50th wedding anniversary this weekend. And he has taken the opportunity to take his, uh, his bride on uh, some time off. He normally doesn't do that, but you know, 50 years, you've got to do something special, right? right? So we're glad he has done that. I've asked Elder Bryant to help us. We're introducing tonight our new secretary treasurer for ASI. A few months ago, the North American Division, in partnership and cooperation with the ASI leadership, uh, underwent a process to try to find a new ASI secretary treasurer and ASI director for the North American Division. Uh, after much prayer and conversation and looking around and considering many names, uh, we came down, the Lord led us to one particular name. Uh, his name is Philip Baptiste. And we are very, very happy to welcome Philip and his wife to the North American Division family and to the ASI family. That is for sure. That is a real privilege to have Philip on board. Uh, Philip is an ordained minister in the Seventh day Adventist Church. Uh, he has served as pastor in several congregations. He served as a communication director uh, in one or two of our conferences. And he also served as assistant to the president in the East Central Africa Division for four and a half years, where one of his assignments was to be the ASI Secretary Treasurer. Amen. And so the Lord has blessed us. We believe God has led us uh, to Elder Baptiste to come and join our family and to be a part of the ASI organization and help to lead us in this next phase God is leading us in. And so I would like to present and introduce Elder Philip Baptiste as the next ASI Secretary Treasurer for the ASI organization and ASI Director for the North American Division. Thank you, Elder Bryant. Philip, say a word tonight to the audience. Uh, we've baptized him this week with a little bit of fire. Uh, how long have you been on the job, Philip? Uh, just since Sunday. <laughs> so he showed up here at convention time on Sunday, and uh, I think we've been in meetings about 12 hours a day every day since then. That's right. <laughs> but it's such an honor and a joy to be a part of this great ASI family and to engage in this awesome mission of sharing Christ in the marketplace. I'm excited to work with Steve and the team and looking forward to doing all we can to hasten the soon coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Philip. We just appreciate that. One other introduction we're making tonight for many of you, you know that uh, Sharon Blumenberg will be retiring after this convention. And we needed to fill that position. And uh, some of you may recognize Sharon Robertson. We were just kind of joking about it that uh, in order to fill this position, you need to have a certain name. Uh, it should be Sharon. And uh, so Sharon Robertson is stepping back into the role she held a number of years ago. Uh, and so, Sharon, we appreciate you coming back on board with us. We're looking forward to having Sharon back with us, helping us with convention planning, and we wanted to make that introduction tonight as well. So we're entering into ASI now full-time for the next few days. May God bless each one of you. And as you see these folks in the hall, just stop and greet them and get acquainted with them. We know that God is going to bless their ministry with ASI. Thank you. I will be with the Global Youth Leadership Congress in Kassel, Germany, with about 1,700 leaders in youth ministry all over this globe. Please pray for us. I will be praying for you as you, with your very special theme, Unusual Business, 
unusual unity, unusual focus, unusual commitment, as you focus upon how best to join hands together with all those who are focused upon total member involvement, looking towards Christ's soon coming, everyone doing something for Jesus. I want to thank uh, ASI for the tremendous blessing you are worldwide and in North America. Thank you for holding firmly to God's precious biblical principles. Thank you for the proclamation of sharing the incredible three angels' messages in everything that you do in the marketplace and elsewhere. Uh, I want to also uh, strongly appreciate uh, the tremendous projects, I believe about 42 projects that you sponsored last year. Thank you for what you're doing to help the mission of the church. Now, some of you may say, well, Pastor Wilson, he looks a little bit different. Well, that's because we are focusing upon Battle Creek, Michigan, where our annual council of the executive committee of the General Conference will take place. Normally, we hold it in Silver Spring, Maryland, but this time we're going to Battle Creek and uh, encouraged people to uh, certainly we will be dressing in uh, some period costumes and uh, those who wish to can grow a beard not of any religious uh, significance but of highly spiritual connection in that as we go to Battle Creek our theme will be the past with a future looking back to move forward, mission. Ellen White has told us in the spirit of prophecy that we have nothing to fear for the future except that we forget how God has led us in the past and his teaching in our past history. So pray for us as we will be in Battle Creek and as we will be focusing upon the mission of the church, remembering how God has led us in the past. And the same thing for ASI, as you focus upon this unusual business that God has placed in your hands, unusual unity and focus and commitment. God bless each one of you in a very special way. Thank you again for what you are doing for God's church. We believe in ASI. Let's look to the Lord as he leads us towards that wonderful soon coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Maranatha. Good evening, ASI. Oh, that's a live crowd. I'm glad. It's kind of uh, new to see Elder Wilson with a beard. I like it. Anyhow, I'm glad everybody survived the rain and was able to make it here tonight. I'd like to draw your attention to the, your bulletin or your handout, the seminar presentations. There are some exciting seminars that we are coming up with for the next two days. I know for myself, the seminars are one of the most exciting things that, um, that we have coming up. So we're going to be introducing a number of our speakers here for the seminars tomorrow. Now the seminars tomorrow start at 1045 in the morning and then at 330 in the afternoon. So what time are you supposed to be at the seminars? 1045. And the afternoon? 3.30. All right. This is really exciting. So we're going to have our speakers introduce what they're going to be talking about tomorrow. My name is Rodney Bowes, and I'm the president for Health Expo Resources and a divisional director for Light Ministry. Tomorrow morning at 10.45, I'm going to share a seminar. It's actually a panel discussion with Vicki Griffin and Joshua Vasquez entitled Sustainable Health Evangelism. I'm so excited because we're going to look at several models that are proven to show how God's message of health and evangelism can be combined so that medical and non-medical people can be involved in gospel ministry all year long. You're going to learn about how practical it is to share the love of Jesus with the world. I'm Lilia Wagner and I'm Director of Philanthropic Service for Institutions. By the time I was 10 years old, I had been a refugee, an immigrant, lived on three continents and spoke four languages. 
So I grew up with a tremendous appreciation for diversity. And that appreciation grew when I got into fundraising and the field of philanthropy because our backgrounds do count when we are being generous. So we're going to examine that tomorrow, how our differences, our roots, can be used positively because philanthropy truly is a matter of inclusivity for good purposes. Hi, I'm Joanne Davidson. I teach theology at the Andrews University Theological Seminary. And tomorrow afternoon, we're going to be discussing the glories of Sabbath. You know, Seventh-day Adventists rightly proclaim the Seventh-day Sabbath. And we think it's so important we put it in our name. But, you know, the Sabbath is a lot more than not Sunday. And sometimes I get the feeling that we spend most of our time trying to decide what to do and not to do on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is much bigger than that. Tomorrow afternoon, we're going to look at some practical ways to remind ourselves of the glorious nature of this gift of time. In fact, I think it's one of the great reasons that we can say God is love, you know, because lovers like to spe set specific times to be together. My name is Joy Kaufman, and the session I'm leading will be a relevant health message for a global church. I want to ask you all three quick interactive questions. One, do you truly believe that Jesus desires abundant life for all people? Two, if there were a recipe for abundant life, would you want to know it? And three, if you were convinced that recipe works, would you be motivated to share it? If you answered yes to all three, then the Farm Stew Session and Booth are the place to be. Good evening. I'm Dr. David DeRose. I'm excited to tell you that we've got a new book coming out. It's called The Methuselah Factor, How to Live Sharper, Leaner, Longer, and Better in 30 Days or Less. Actually, that's our title for our seminar at 3.30 tomorrow. I'm going to show you how to use that book, as well as some existing resources that we've got, a DVD miniseries and 30 free online videos to improve your own health and to be a more effective health evangelist. Tomorrow afternoon, Danny Houghton and I will have the pleasure of speaking on religion and business. We are told that during a time when church and state were united, that men and women with the skill of business were welcomed as merchants where they would have been spurned as missionaries. So tomorrow afternoon we're going to talk about the coming disruption that we believe is coming from Adventism and the business world. Join us. Those are exciting. Oh, so exciting. And we have one more that wasn't, our speaker wasn't be able to be here tonight. And if you look, it's Revelino Montenegro, and he's, how is science confirming the biblical view of our common ancestor? How did the races come out? How did this all come about? The scientific basis for this, and that's at 1045. So I'm looking forward to seeing you all there, and I hope you enjoy all of these seminars. See you tomorrow. Good evening, ASI. How many of you got wet this evening? I see a few hands. Well, I'm glad to be here this evening with Lisa and with Josh, and they're going to tell us what's going on that's unusual at, AS, or at uh, Eden Valley. Eden Valley. That's right. Good, ev good evening. Well, this is Josh, and I met Josh five years ago. I can't believe it's been five years, but I met him five years ago. And uh, Josh was... Uh, had a conversion experience at Youth for Jesus right here in Orlando. And right after that, you were baptized. Then what happened after that? After that, I was uh, invited by Lisa to come to Eden Valley and go to their health evangelism training. Um, and part of the reason is because in your uh, testimony, you were saying that you didn't want to go back to your environment. Right, yeah, I didn't want to go back with my friends and, and that whole group that I was associated with and get stuck there so so that was august like three or something and where were you august six uh three days after talking to lisa i was on a plane to loveland colorado where and I went god to worked valley. everything out and he's amazing so what happened at eden valley what did you learn there at eden valley i learned uh health evangelism and christ's method and uh, we did natural remedies we did massage we did hydrotherapy a uh, bunch of things that I'm using now in my ministry, 
and, and reaching out to the community and using that in the evangelism cycle. So as well as learning medical missionary work, you learned how to bridge from medical missionary to evangelism. And we used what method? Uh, Christ's method alone. Well, I mean, <laughs> through yeah, that. wellness coaching. Yeah, through wellness coaching. Okay, so tell us what wellness coaching is and how you're using that in your ministry now. So wellness coaching is uh, something that any lay person can do, and it's helping people achieve goals following the eight laws of health. And we use it as a bridge to all sorts of programs. We're finding that it's a perfect bridge to just about every program that the church does. Cooking classes, uh, depression recovery, um, all sorts of uh, programs that we're doing. So it's, it's really, really nice. Yeah, you know, for a lot of church members, they want to do outreach, but you're scared. Um, you know, doing Bible studies is sometimes intimidating for people, but you can, we all have the health message, is that right? And we know what, what, how people should live healthy. And you can, if you're trained, you can take what you know and go into people's homes and coach them. And coaching them is different than, uh, advising them and tell us how it's different. So there's two things that you need to know to be a good wellness coach and that's asking open-ended questions and that's being a good listener. And so that's something that we really focus on in our training. You're not telling the person what to do, they're creating their own personalized plan and so it's something that is within their range, something they feel comfortable with and you're just there to guide them and help them through the way. Yes, and all of our students that we've taught, and even the wellness coaching that I'm doing, every single one, 100% of the clients turn into Bible study students. So it's a really easy way. You already have a relationship, and when in every lesson or every session, there's spiritual components to it. So how are you using this in your church? Um, I think there's some pictures of you. Yes, Doing there should ministry. be some pictures somewhere. Um, we're using it through, this is a depression recovery class that we did. We had seven people in that class and four of them were actually doing wellness coaching. We got them doing it, so a good number there. Um, there's some other slides. Uh, this is a cooking class that we were doing at our church here. We do it downstairs in the school. And we actually had a guy that the hospital said, um, you should go to the Adventist church because they're doing things on health. And as soon as he came in the door, I mentioned wellness coaching and he signed right up, just like that. This was a hands-on cooking class we were doing at our last church. And doing Christ's method there, we actually became the fastest growing church in the North Pacific Union per capita. In two years, we went from 40 on Sabbath to 90. Yeah. This is a lady we're working with now. She's a church member, and she was diagnosed with colon cancer. We've been doing hydrotherapy with her, fever treatments twice a week. Uh, she's juicing. She's totally vegan, and she doesn't feel the tumor anymore. There's no more pain. It's going down. So pretty soon she'll be going for a CT scan. This is an, a young lady that, was nine, or that is 19, and she was diagnosed with a uh, fast-growing cancer that was from her tailbone to her heart when they found it. And within a month, doing natural um, lifestyle, following the eight laws of health and chemo, she is now cancer-free a month later. So praise the Lord. It really sped things up and, and helped, her, helped her go. So this is, this is one method that we teach at Eden Valley as well as how to actually do the treatment. Um, you had a, an experience recently with uh, Pastor Mark Finley. He came to Upper Columbia Conference uh, camp meeting, and he found out that your church was the fastest growing church and asked you how, what, what did he ask you actually? He wanted to know more about it, and uh, he was really impressed with the method that, method that we're doing. He saw it as a ray of light, as he said, and so he had us come out to uh, Living Hope and train his, uh, his Bible workers there and set them on the path. And now the churches that are around there are hearing about it, and they are wanting to be trained as well. And you're going to be doing a little bit of training? Yes. So uh, my wife and I, we could come to the churches, and we can train on a weekend, and we're also training at Eden Valley as well. So if you want the short clip, we can come to your church. If you want the extensive training that I got, Eden Valley is the place to go. Okay. And... Uh Tomorrow, when is your seminar? Tomorrow morning at 
Yeah, he's going to be on a panel at 1045 tomorrow morning on health evangelism that's sustainable. So be there um, and learn how your church can be more effective for the gospel. Do you know where it is? It's in the Sebastian I-2 building at 1045. So just around the corner when you see Sebastian, it's the second room on the right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amen. So you've got someone who came to Christ through ASI, has come back, and is contributing at ASI. That's exciting to me. Uh, Sean Wycliffe is here, and he's going to share a little bit about what they're doing at the fruit tree. What is the fruit tree? Yes, so the fruit tree is an operation based out of Berkeley, San Francisco, where we make and sell organic green smoothies at farmer's markets. We started this uh, about a year ago. Our goal was to figure out a way where we could support ourselves financially while doing evangelism in our community. And so we settled on making and selling green smoothies, initially door to door, and it worked more or less, but then we started getting into farmer's markets. And so now we're actually in 21 farmer's markets across the Bay Area. If you show some slides, I can show you a little bit about what's been happening now. And so again, this was founded uh, about a year ago. We actually just passed over 40,000 a month in sales. Praise God. And we're actually selling over 3,000 of these smoothies per month at this point. And so there's also six workers that are supported as their full-time uh, way of making a primary income. And so God has really blessed this even just over the last 12 months. Amen. So tell me a little bit about how much that one costs that you're holding in your hand. Yes, yeah, so, you know, this is the Bay Area, and so our goal is to meet people where they're at, for better or worse. And so, this is a 32-ounce organic green smoothie. It's kale, spinach, strawberry, apple, pear, lemon, and ginger. No sugar added, nothing else added. It's $14, and we'll give you $2 back if you return the glass jar. Wow, huh? So tell us why you're there. We know what you're doing. Tell us why you're really there. What are you doing? Absolutely. So it's really all about evangelism. It's all about evangelism. And so we wanted to figure out a way where we could reach people where they're at. And we found that a lot of people are at the farmer's markets and a lot of people want to eat healthy. And so I wanted to share a few things that we're doing. We have so many things we're doing, but just a few. If you show the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about what we call the fruit tree philosophy. And so we all love glow tracks, I'm assuming. Amen. And so we wanted to reach people with them, but we felt there was too big of a jump sometimes. And so we ended up developing our own glow tracks. We call this the fruit tree philosophy. People ask us, why do you do this? Or why can't you make it to my Saturday farmer's markets? And so we get in a lot of conversations. Well, we put that into a tract. It basically tells our testimony. And then it gets into a Bible study on health. And then from there, we invite them to discuss our philosophy more with us, a.k.a. Bible studies. And Man. so we've been really excited about this. We've handed out thousands of these so far, even over the last few months. And so we're excited about where God has us going with that. Very good. You know, religion and business are not two separate things. They're one. And this is an example of how someone is using the gifts that God's given them to both be in business successfully and to reach souls for the kingdom. We should be excited to see more of that going on as well. Amen, amen. And so there's two specific testimonies I wanted to share with you. If you go to the next slide, because it's more than just handing out tracts. Handing out tracts is amazing, but it, it's really about reaching souls for Christ as well. And so I want to tell you a little bit about Chorkin. She is someone that graduated from UC Berkeley. She has a Buddhist agnostic background. And so she needed something to do for work. And so we basically gave her a job at the fruit tree. We actually are now able to give people jobs. We're actually recruiting now as well. And so she started working with us. She was an Adventist or Christian. Started interacting with a lot of the people working with us. Well, long story short, she gave her life to Christ after a few months. And about a month ago, I had the, the honor to baptize her at our local church. Amen? Amen. Amen. One other testimony I want to share. The next person is on the next slide. And his name's Nandu. Now, some people think that's me. That's not me. <laughs> but... He looks like me sometimes. And so Nandu is a Hindu, or he was a Hindu. And so we met him at the farmer's market. He's selling Indian food. And so through dialogue and conversation, the topic of religion came up. And through that, we told him what we believe in, and he told us a little bit about himself. And there was an invitation for Bible studies. Well, he accepted, 
and he started studying the Bible with us. This is all in real time. This just literally happened a few months ago. Well, through that, he learned over the Sabbath, and then he said, I'm going to tell my boss that I will never work on Sabbath anymore. And so he did that. And then a few weeks later, he became a Christian. And then a few weeks later, he was baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist in our local Amen. church. Amen. And so this is really what this is about. The fruit tree, yes, it's about green smoothies. We want to spread the health message. But we want to spread the gospel with that. We want to use the health message's right arm to reach people for the gospel. Amen? Amen. You know, it's exciting to see an invasion of the devil's land. You know, we call it the post-Christian triangle. But, and he's being able to reach through simple means people for the gospel. Amen. 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 And so the last thing I want to share with you is where we're at now and what's happening next. If you go to the last slide, this actually talks about where we could use help. And so this is actually expanding so fast by God's grace. And so we need workers. We actually need lots of prayer. And so if you can help us with that, we're also in the process of trying to secure some land so we can not only make our green smoothies on there, but we can actually farm them as well. And so we can have the full experience. And so we're looking for donations or even investment on the business side of things for land or even for vans. Right now, in, in some of the farmer's market, we're packing a Honda Civic, believe it or not, with a farmer's market tent and a couple coolers of green smoothies. And so there's a lot of exciting things that are happening. But we have a booth as well. And so it's booth 1024. We have a, free, uh, a bunch of free samples for everybody. For the next few days, so come by and get your free sample. We're also selling these. This is our large size. We also have a medium and a small. And if you know anybody else that would be great for us to talk to, we love you to connect us with them. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you so see, much. See, I'm going to be working on getting that one after we get backstage. You know? Yeah, I'll, I'll have it queued up for you, Craig. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, our next group should be coming out any moment, and we're going to be looking forward to hearing from them. We actually have them here all the way from Spain. And so come on out, guys, and let's tell them about what you do. Um, see if I get these, these names right. It should be Juan Soroka um, here on my left, and further over, his friend um, Silvu Dima. And tell us, guys, a bit about what is Logos TV. Logos TV is an Adventist TV channel reaching 40 million people in Spain alone and uh, covering with the satellite Europe and North Africa. That, mean, that means large bills, of course, <laughs> but we trust in God every day, working every day, trusting the Lord will provide through this uh, Christian family. Amen. And now we can see the video. We have a two-minute sure. video. Yeah. If we can get the video run, that'd be great. Jesus said that nobody puts a lamp inside a drawer. Instead, they put it up high to provide light for everyone. There are many still in need of hearing about Christ's soon coming. Logos TV is a lay ministry focused on this task. In a Catholic country, the Adventists are now relevant. Logos TV is an Adventist channel that reaches 40 million people in Spain alone. April 2017 was a milestone in the Logos TV history. Our channel started broadcasting on a new network four times larger than an old one, in addition to satellite. A network with 50 antennas and a free satellite channel, Hispasat, that covers Europe and the north of Africa. It's more than we could ever have imagined when we started. We are very pleased with the work Logos TV has done so far. We have never had such a powerful ministry before now. This network has touched the lives of 5,000 viewers that have reached out to us, and many have been transformed. I am Angel Duo, and for five years I served as the president for ASI Europe, and I can joyfully say that God has worked through this ministry. There are evangelical pastors that keep the Sabbath at home now, while going to their churches on Sunday. We wait for great things to happen. Congratulations on your channel, so much more instructive and educational than most things shown on the other channels. Visible anytime, anywhere in the world. LogosTV.es
Yeah, it's a privilege to take the, the message to so many people. So we want to continue with faith and courage. And uh, please pray for us. In the north of Spain, in the city of Ferrol, uh, the two pastors of, of an evangelical church came to see the Adventist pastor, and they said, uh, the whole church is keeping the Sabbath because we learn in our channel, our TV channel, and we are ready to change. We decided to change. And they decided to take the banner out and put a new one saying Adventist Church. Amen. The whole church became Adventist. Yeah. Lucero was a Christian woman in Madrid. And Lucero, when, when she passed uh, by the Adventist Church, she thought, I hate Adventists. Because at her church, she was told that the Adventists are bigoted people, legalist and an extremist and when she arrived home she was watching our channel and she enjoyed and she was moved by the holy spirit and she praised god for this channel and later she discovered that was an adventist one man yes and she thought surprise well uh, adventists are not so bad so she was baptized in the Adventist Church, Aluche, Madrid, and her sister also. The Lord yeah. sneaks right in people's TVs sometimes. It's great. Yeah. yeah. So but, tell us a bit about how it is that this came to be, because you've told us that you are doing a TV station, mm -hmm. but TV station isn't something that happens like that. Yes. How did we happen? started very small, nine years ago, just in a small city. But uh, a miracle happened. The Lord blessed every step growing. And uh, last year, in April, uh, the owner of a national network called us and told us that our channel had, him, had made an impact on him. Amen. And he wanted to uh, make it easier for us to have a larger network. And he did it. And it's working for now. Amen. Uh, now, more than 5,000 uh, people reach out to us asking for more information or calling with many questions. Mm -hmm. And we are making an effort with programming, producing programming for the secular mindset of Europe. Here, Silvio Dima is the production director. He's making a wonderful work with this. Yes, I just uh, tell you that uh, Carmen, for example, Carmen, was a Jehovah Witness. And she was watching Logos TV, and she discovered the Bible doctrines. And then Jehovah Witnesses, usually they reject information from other churches. But when nobody is watching, they enjoy our channel, many of them. And, and Carmen was baptized, and she said, I found the people of the Bible. Mm -hmm. In several cities, we have this same experience. Uh, you can visit our booth. Uh, we have a little present for you. And more information is the booth at 7 to 8. To help you find your way, there's a satellite hanging over the booth. Amen. Our motto is, everything is possible to those who believe. Amen. Amen. So exciting to see all around the world lay people rising up to do the work we're called to do. And so be praying for them, encouraging them, and we hope that it inspires each person to find a way to reach people for the kingdom of Christ. Thank you so much. Thank you. I remember when I went to my first ASI convention. I actually didn't have any idea what ASI even was. I only went because I had a friend that was going who invited me. But when I went to ASI, it opened my eyes to a world that I didn't know existed. To be honest, I didn't know that there were all these ministries, all of these people just doing these different things for the Lord. And it made a strong, strong impact on my life. In fact, I can trace my first desires to go into doing more ministry for God to to seeing that ASI and people that I met who were working with ASI, working with the Youth for Jesus programs and other things like that that I would have had no idea about had it not been for ASI. I sense a need in our church for 
for a way that people can come together, for a place to, to belong in the church. I feel like sometimes it gets portrayed like the epitome of Adventism is going to church and paying tithe and maybe participating in outreach sometime. But in my personal experience, it's so much more than that. And there are so many of us that are striving in our daily lives to do things for the Lord, but, but where do we fit? Where do we come together? I mean, how do we get re-inspired and networked and get the support that we need? And I see that as a huge need. I see that as something that if we could really form that kind of network and do this together, that all of us could benefit, that all of us could grow and feel like we mean something in the church. Like we have a purpose, we have a place in the church and that God is going to really be able to use, yeah, not just the pastors, not just the elders, but those of us in everyday life to do something for him. For the past 40 years, Weimar Institute has brought hope and healing to the world. Today we are home to a variety of ministries such as the New Start Lifestyle Center and Weimar College while we share health and education and spiritual truths through mission trips. Our focus is on our local community through our total community involvement. As we strive to meet those needs, we operate from aging buildings, time, use, and environmental issues have taken their toll. New housing for staff and students is needed. A multi-story housing unit is the answer to this dilemma. ASI's support for this project will enable us to attract service-minded staff and students. 
We want to also thank you for ASI's previous funding of our College Ramp Edition and for the many ways ASI enables ministries to become a spiritual home for those we serve. At Weimar College, just an hour north of Sacramento here in, or not here, in California. And with me is Randy Bivens, who's the Chief Operating Officer, to share with us a little bit more about how our offerings provided some assistance for that project that are there at Weimar. I, <clears throat> I don't know if you saw some of the drone shots right there at the end, but we're in the process of building a 20-unit staff housing complex. The cost of that building is $3.7 million dollars and we're building and we have 1.2 million of it. And you ask, well, it's gonna take about eight months to finish and we believe that God will provide that. He has before, he's going to do it again. And that's a critical need for us on campus as we're growing with an active nursing program and expanding college. Our, our academy is pretty much closed uh, um, applications because we're completely full for the academic year. So we're just kind of busting at the seams and we need more staff housing. And we, uh, Weimar Institute has been the recipient of multiple offerings from ASI. The last one, the most significant offering we've ever received last year was $200,000 toward this building. And we want to thank ASI for that. Absolutely. We're happy to do it. Yes. Now, you mentioned um, we are expecting miracles from God because he has done it before. Can you share with us one experience where God has done a miraculous thing to provide for Weimar? Um, I, you know, it's, I, I should write a book. Someone said I should write a book. Um, when I started there five years ago, and you may have heard this story, but retelling it doesn't, uh, doesn't hurt. Um, when I started, we had a $3 million debt. And uh, the big first board meeting, they kept looking at me thinking I was going to solve that problem for them. And I said, well, we can't even balance our budget. How are we going to service a debt? And I said, we have to give this to God. If it doesn't work, we might as well lock the gate and throw away the key, go home. Um, within 12 hours, we'd received a letter from a probate attorney granting us 25% of an $8.2 million estate. So God blessed before you even knowing how and when he would, and Absolutely. very soon. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned that, uh, you mentioned nursing. There's yes. a nursing program, and that's one that we've heard a little bit about. Tell us what has transpired since the miracles that God has wrought in the establishing of that program. Well, when I started, we were in the throes of trying to get accreditation for nursing. The state of California, the BRN, the Board of Registered Nursing, actually comes and certifies us independent of our accreditation process. And I actually believe from a financial standpoint, it was stupid. I just thought there was no way, no way we were ever going to get approved. And I remember going to the last meeting down in Southern California where we were meeting the, the committee that was going to grant us approval, and they actually granted us approval. And we, we, I remember Dr. Siebold and I went up and spoke to the chairman of the committee, and he said, I know you Adventist. He goes, I had an uncle who was a teacher at Oakwood College. God had gone before us. But since then, we actually started the nursing program. We've now graduated our second cohort of nurses. And I have to tell you that um, I know that there is not one other nursing program with a higher success rate than we have had in the entire world. Because 100% of our graduates have passed the NCLEX on their first attempt. Two years running. Praise God. Now, I have to say, as a nurse, that is remarkable. To have a brand new nursing program right out the gate, to have that level of success is not heard of. In fact, the state of California said that you have to keep your pass rate above 75% or you'll be on probation. And uh, I just wonder if we need our, I hope our standards are not so high that we're just admitting the, high, the most intelligent people. But I know there have been some struggles with some students, but God has blessed. In fact, there's, there are a minimum of 75 questions on the exam. And the computer knows that if you've already passed it, it will stop asking questions at 75. And our last cohort of nurses that went through, every single one of them at 75 questions, it stopped asking they had already done so well, they, they knew they'd already passed because it wasn't asking them any more questions. Now, I want you to share with um, our ASI family uh, the experience that you shared with me because these nursing students didn't just learn book stuff. They learned how to really minister, and you have a great well, story about that. Well, many of these students come from us, to us, with uh, already a Weimar philosophy of health evangelism. In fact, they go through an entire 
18-day New Start program. They go through an entire residential depression recovery program as part of their nursing program. And, and that's kind of amazing because those questions aren't on the NCLEX. I mean, that's in addition. But we had, <clears throat> excuse me, we had a group of students who were on a clinical rotation in Auburn, um, I believe it was an Auburn um, hospital, and there was a preoperative uh, a patient who was very, very anxious. And one of the, the nursing students recognized that this was a problem, and she immediately knew what to do. She got two or three of her other students around, and they sang a hymn to this preoperative patient who was so anxiety-ridden. And that calmed her down. And the nursing supervisor watched this kind of like, I've never seen this happen before. She actually called the entire group into her office and she shut her door and she said, I want to tell you, I've never seen anything so amazing. She goes, you, any one of you will always have a job here at this hospital. We That's actually, our, our first cohort of nurses, we had three <clears throat> hospital administrators who were willing to hire the entire class. Um, so. I, the, we have had no lack of getting these, these students into positions. If they want a job, they've got a job. And California is one of the hardest markets to actually get nursing jobs in because the pay is so amazingly high. But they've all gotten job positions that have wanted to be employed. So the Lord is using Weimar College and its programs to tell about him by right. their experience and their witnessing to others. That's just incredible. Is there anything else you want to share well, with us in 30 I, I seconds? Just, I just want to thank ASI in general. Five years running, um, we have been the recipient of offerings, and some of that offering was for the nursing program startup. And I just want to thank all of you because it's often sacrificial. And the nice thing about ASI is when you give an offering, it actually goes in this year, this year 38 different projects, but they have all been vetted. They've all been tra carefully tracked. And, and there's very little administrative overhead. It's probably the best place to put your money. And I just want to thank ASI and all of the members for continuing to contribute to all of our programs. Thank you very much, Randy. God bless Webar. Now coming to the podium is Jeffrey Cobb. Jeffrey Cobb runs, is the founder of Shelter from the Storm. It's a transitioning housing complex in Gainesville, Florida for uh, men who uh, have been released from prison. And uh, you're gonna have to catch us up. Some of us who have been with you a long time know the story, but there are some who don't know the story. So tell us how all of this started. How it started was I was incarcerated living in Miami, robbing, kidnapping, shootouts, down with crooked lawyers, judges, and police officers for 20 years. So after that, I, I got arrested and I was facing 30 to life in prison. So I told the Lord, if he got me out of that one, he ain't had to worry about me no more getting in trouble. So it, it, by God's grace, it's been 21 years I've been out and clean. Amen. Amen. Now, when is it that, yes, amen. <laughs> Where did you meet Jesus in that journey? I met Jesus. I, I was in Miami County Jail, and the guy came in, and he was like, I said, man, you going to church Sunday? He was like, man, you're going the wrong day. I was like, man, you must be getting drunk and drugged and in prison. And you know they got the drugs in the prison just like on the street. I said, this guy must be high. He talking about Saturday. So after that, I got mad with him. I told him he wasn't my friend no more. Matter of fact, I was finna stab him with a knife in prison. I said, he trying me. Talking about Saturday. I said, he got it twisted. And so you found out that, that you he, had it twisted. I had it twisted. <laughs> Okay, so then you met Jesus, and you um, actually were released from prison. And when you were released from prison, because you were now new in the Seventh-day Adventist faith, you were looking for a specific kind of environment. Yes, yeah, so once, uh, you know, you Adventists beat me across the head with the word and about the Sabbath. So when I got ready to get out, I was like, okay, these people talking about they got the truth and the Sabbath. Okay, I accept it. So when I got ready to get out, I didn't want to go back to that lifestyle because I know if I got back in trouble, it was going to start with 30 years on up to life. So I went to the prison ministry guy, say, hey, do y'all have a transition house? 
And he looked at me and said, no. I said, then he must he don't have the truth then. You done brought the word to me and talk about his truth. Now I done accept the message. We done came like family, a relationship. Now it's time for me to get out. Now you telling me you don't have no place for me to go. So fast forward to actually 16 years ago when Jeffrey realized that there isn't a place for Adventists to come, even if they're coming out of prison, then that's not good. Then they're going to another place and getting their uh, support from, from others and leaving the truth. So you started Shelter from the Storm. Amen. The Lord uh, just put on my heart. I said, Lord, we need a transition house. The Lord said, I want to use you to start one then. So I was like, oh, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was like, all right, Lord. And I was continuing to go forth in the Lord because it helped me so much going through a transition house. These guys getting out of prison, they been there for 15 years and they get out with $50. By the time they come from the prison, and you know how the Greyhound bus make 50 stops before they get you to your destination, they have been done at them $50 up. So when they get to their destination, they ain't got nothing. So what they do is go back to what they know because I, I did it about four or five times. So I was like, okay, I need to counteract that. So I was saying once we have a transition house, they have a place to live, we provide them food, we provide them a job, and, and we have them a support group. So I was saying if somebody don't want to, can't do right with that, then they don't want to do right. So um, you've been operating Shelter from the Storm for men for the last 16 years. We've got a couple minutes. I want you to share a little bit about what this year's offering is going to do because there's still a need, but a different need. For women. Mm -hmm. um, uh, hour and a half north is the largest women facility in the nation. Over 4,000 women. And a lot of Adventists work in the administration, and they witnessing to the women. And then when the women, time to go home, they come up to them and say, hey, do you all have a place for me to go? And they said they feel like they letting the girls down. And I just want to share a quick story. One time I was with the lawn service. I was doing this realtor and broke a lawn. And he said, Jeff, why you don't do women? I say, man, I said, man, I don't have no money to get a place. He said, I'll tell you what you should do. I got a townhouse. I'm going to give you six months to use it free. And I took in three women. Two of the women still in the church. And one of the women, she was a Catholic. Every Friday, she called me and said, Jeff, we got to talk. I don't know about this Sabbath thing. Every pride, I say, but you signed the rules to come to the program, and now you can't beat her out of the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Every time I go to the church where she go, hey Jeff, and then she say, Jeff, when you gonna do a women house? She say, cause I want to give back, and it's a lot of women in Gainesville, you know, over three years, cause I'm not finna deal with it. So in three years, I've been hearing, Jeff, won't you get a women house once you start a women house. So in about three Sundays ago, uh, they interviewed me, Channel 20, our local news, interviewed me the work that I was doing. So then I started getting calls from everywhere, and uh, it just been a blessing. Yesterday, the state senate of Gainesville, he called me and said, Jeff, I heard you finna start a women house. I say, yeah. He say, call me in a week, and I want to give a donation towards the ministry. Amen. So Lord will provide, and we can help. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Amen. In Matthew 18, 19, we're told, If two of you shall agree as touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of our Father which is in heaven. Now, regarding this Bible promise, Ellen White actually makes an interesting statement. She said, this promise is made on condition that the united prayers of the church are offered, and in answer to these prayers, there may be expected a power greater 
than that which comes in answer to private prayer. But this is the key. The power given will be proportionate to the unity of the members and their love for God and for one another. I have a couple pictures I want to share with you briefly this evening. The first one is from a group of young people in the Philippines meeting together to pray uh, every morning at 5 o'clock. You can see the picture there. And as you can see, there are hundreds of them gathered there to pray. Now, why would these young people be willing to get up so early to sacrifice sleep and time to pray? I believe it's because they recognize that we are living in unusual times in Earth's history. And they also recognize their unusual, desperate need for a closer walk with God. Now, it's really exciting to me because what I see happening in the Philippines and other countries around the world, I also see happening here. The second photo that I want to show with you this evening is from this past GYC conference this last December. We had over 800 people meeting together to pray every morning at 6 o'clock in the morning. There were so many people, they were actually overflowing into the hallways. As we are beginning this ASI convention this evening, I have a question for you. It's obvious that business cannot continue as usual any longer. But do we recognize that the unusual times in which we're living also call for unusual unity and unusual humility? And these gifts we are only going to find as we come together to the foot of the cross. As you know, ASI believes in the power of corporate united prayer, so we want to invite you to join us every morning at 7 a.m. in Sebastian I-4, we're going to have a short prayer devotional and then a time of prayer. And as many can attest, this is a special experience that you don't want to miss. So I look forward to seeing you at 7 a.m. in the morning. All right. You have your uh, programs in hand. And in your programs is a bio for our opening speaker, Pastor John Bradshaw. So I'm not going to read the bio to you, but I'll give you some things from my own experience. I've known Pastor Bradshaw since, let's see, I'm general manager now. Before that, I was an employee. I was on the board uh, and a partner of it is written. And I was actually on the committee that got to vote him in as speaker director for It Is Written. He is a writer. He's a voice and video artist. He's a husband and father. Now, I should warn you, he does have a bit of an accent, okay? He's, he's from the deep south and I mean the really deep south. He's from New Zealand. As a friend, I can tell you something that he would never tell you, uh, and that is that, that John is entirely dedicated to serving God, entirely. He's uh, committed to spreading the everlasting gospel. This isn't just a job to him. Uh, it's not just a good thing to do. It's who he is. It is absolutely who he is. So after our special music tonight, the next voice you'll hear will be Pastor John Bradshaw. Last night I lay sleeping, there came a dream so Stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, methought the voice of angels from heaven in answering, methought the voice of angels from heaven. In answer, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, lift up your gates and sing a hosanna in the highest hosanna to your. And 
then I thought my dream was change the streets no longer ran hushed were the glad hosannas that the little children sang the sun drew dark with mysteries the morn was cold and chill as the shadows of a cross arose upon a lonely hill as the shadows of a cross arose upon a lonely hill Jerusalem Jerusalem hark how the angels sing Again, the scene was changed. New earth there seemed to be. I saw the holy city beside a tideless sea. The light of God was on the streets, and the gates were open wide, and all who would might enter, and no one was denied the need of a moon or the stars by night nor the sun to shine by day it was the new Jerusalem that would not pass away it was Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Rain SI 2018. Enjoy that little display we had earlier. For all I know, it might be still going on. I thought tonight we could be competing with the thunder in here. I could hear it earlier. But I think it's okay. I mentioned it to somebody, and that person said, it's like the Holy Spirit coming down like the rain. I said, that's okay. That's what we want. Well, let's pray and expect God to bless us tonight, shall we? To bless us more tonight let's pray our father in heaven we come to you in the name of Jesus and we are grateful that we can we thank you that we can be in this place tonight where the focus is on salvation and seeking the lost and blessing lives and lifting people up and being involved in ministry on the front lines financially invested we are grateful we thank you for soul winning and evangelism your great gift to the end time church and we pray that because we've been here tonight we would hear your voice and we would be encouraged Lord I pray 
knowing that you will not rely on the limitations of fallen humanity tonight. And I pray your spirit would not be restricted by that, but that you would speak to us and bless us. We love you, we thank you, we praise you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Please say with me, amen. amen. Every so often you meet somebody who will admit to things that certain other people wouldn't admit to. I was at a camp meeting earlier in the year and spoke with a pastor who happened to mention that he was a musician. And as you do, we talked a little more, and I said, what is it that you played? Or what is it you play? He said, played, played. I said, okay, what was it that you played? And he said, I was a drummer. He didn't look the type. I said, you were, you were a drummer? I mean, what sort of drummer? He said, I was a drummer in a heavy metal band. <laughs> And he didn't look the type, which I think on the balance is a really good thing. Not everybody wants you to know about some things from their past. I'm not trying to suggest that would be the most shameful thing by any means, but it was interesting. There are some things people won't admit to. Many of us here are old enough to remember 1977. That's when Saturday Night Fever came out. And you won't find a person at this convention who will admit to have bought the double album. And some of you did. Many of you, thank God, because you walked a better path, didn't. But some of you did. But you won't admit it. There aren't many people who will admit to having worn once a powder blue polyester suit <coughs> or bell bottoms. I don't think you should admit to that, frankly. Better that you admit to being a heavy metal drummer. 1975. A craze swept the United States. I just wonder how many people would admit to have been part of this. A businessman, well, he was an advertising executive to begin with. His name was Gary Dahl, D-A-H-L. Gary Dahl grew sick and tired of hearing his friends talk about the trouble they were having with their pets. Cats that roamed the neighborhood, dogs that dug in the garden, dogs that shed and left hair or fur or whatever it was they left everywhere they went he said man you all should get a better pet and that's when he came up with the idea a pet you don't have to feed a pet that doesn't shed a pet that doesn't make noise in the middle of the night or any time at all for that matter a pet that won't cost terribly much to buy and if you wanted to buy one you could buy it from him and along with a bed of straw and a cardboard box a little carry container for just $3.95, Mr. Dahl started marketing the pet rock. Did you buy one? <laughs> Out yourself. One honest person here. <laughs> Two. I'm concerned for this year's convention. <laughs> Some of you all are sitting on your hands. <laughs> the pet rock, what a craze, huh? Now, he made a lot of money. He ended up losing a lot of money. In his words, wackos came out of the woodwork to sue him, and he spent money on lawsuits that I think were largely frivolous. He would drive to Rosarito Beach, 10 miles south of the border, the California border, uh, into Mexico. He'd load up with rocks, bring them back, and, and it was just like that. He was selling rocks. He tried to sell a few more fascinating things after that. Uh, one, <laughs> one he would... This is interesting. He sold a tube of sand, and you don't remember this because for some strange reason it wasn't successful. And next to it was another tube of sand. He said, this is the male tube, and this is the female tube. And he says, this is, you know, you can grow your own beach if you just put the sand together. <laughs> he demonstrated lightning does not always strike twice. Of course, people bought pet rocks because what they were doing was buying into the gimmick buying into the fad a pet rock you know you like to think when you get together with other business types or entrepreneurial types that you come away with great ideas great ministry ideas maybe some good business ideas maybe some i don't know ideas to enhance your personal life pet rock who'd have thought that would fly but the pet rock was business finish the phrase it was business yes it was 
It was business unusual. And sometimes business unusual comes along because somebody just has a bright idea. It might be motivated by making money. It might simply be, be because you looked at something and you said, wait, there's a better way. And you can think of many products that you think, I could have thought of that, or I might have thought of that, but somebody looked at what you've been looking at for years and just saw a difference business unusual sometimes business unusual is pressed upon us by the simple fact that the times they are a changing and so a few years ago you could do your shopping without even leaving home the internet came along and what was so fascinating is that you could go online and order your groceries and your food could be delivered to your doorstep what an amazing concept when I was this big, my mother used to get on our telephone, which was a telephone connected to the wall with a curly cord, and she would call Phyllis at the IGA downtown, make her order over the phone, and the man who owned the supermarket would deliver it. So business unusual isn't always very unusual. But we started to shop online, and Amazon changed the world after Walmart changed the world. Business unusual. You know what's odd? I remember when uh, a few years ago when the kids were younger than they are now and we explained to them we said we used to stay at this hotel it was odd that we happened to be back there we used to stay at this hotel we would go to conventions at this hotel oh would you yes we would and let me tell you this when we were looking for restaurants in fact this was at a town that later on we lived in so there was a point of reference and when we looked for a place to eat we would go downstairs and we'd go to the foyer and go to the front desk and they had a card with recommendations on it and you read it and you took down the address and then somebody either had a map or you asked for directions and they looked at us like we had two heads not between us but two each and they looked at us and they said you didn't just google <laughs> things changed business unusual it's all different now Sometimes our business practices change because of great ideas or because of circumstances. Here we are, it is 2018. I'd like to hope that nobody watches this 20 years from now and says, 2018, remember that? I'd like to think that doesn't happen. I'd like to think we're going to be out of here by then. So we'd all like to think we're going to be out of here by then. That's what we all want to think. So the question we've got to ask ourselves is, what are we doing to ensure that we're going to be out of here by then? You see, if you're producing, let me try to think of something, shoes. No one here is doing that. If you're producing shoes, and you're producing a hundred pairs of shoes a day and yet you want to take California by storm with your shoes you know you're gonna to have to produce more than a hundred pairs of shoes a day something's got to change and so you know that you need an injection of cash and you need to hire more staff you've got to buy more equipment things have got to change because if you don't do something different in the way you do your business you are going to end up with exactly the same results. Am I right? Absolutely. So here we are this many years after the church was called into existence by God and we're doing what we're doing and we're doing it how we're doing it. And it would seem then that what we have done that has brought us this far, if we're on a trajectory like this, and I know there are some variables, I will consider those with you. If we're on this trajectory, then the likelihood is we're going to stay on this trajectory if we just keep doing what we're doing so that in 20 years we can come back here and hear somebody say I hope we're not here in 20 years and we can all say amen all over again ladies and gentlemen there is no way in the world we can be satisfied with the status quo we just cannot and that's not to criticize the status quo that's not to say that what we're doing is bad or wrong or foolhardy it's simply to say if we are serious about getting out of here and getting home to where we belong 
we are going to have to change gears. We're going to have to kick it up a notch. We just must because the law says if you keep doing what you're doing, how you've been doing it, you are damned to achieve the same results that you've been achieving. So with that in mind, let's consider a Bible story. We'll go to the book of Numbers and chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11, we're going to start at the beginning of the chapter. That would be verse 1 in most chapters. Numbers chapter 11 and verse 1. And while you're turning, I'll start reading. If you have a Bible, open it up. If you have a device, turn to Numbers chapter 11. And we will begin in verse 1 where the Word of God says, And when the people complain. Now that's something that doesn't happen in church today. That was yesterday. Uh, it's an old-fashioned uh, concept. And when the people complain, it displeased the Lord. Oh, my brother, my sister, we could take an hour to talk about that. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. I read that, and I think about me, to be honest with you. And I say, oh, my goodness, Lord, there has to be a better way than the complaining I do. And if we all thought like that, and if we all gave our complaining to God and invested a fraction of the energy we invest in complaining in ministry, I tell you what, it would be business unusual. It would be business unusual. And so the Word of God says, the people complained, the Lord heard it, he was not happy. The fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost part of the camp. Can you imagine if that happened today? Why did God do that? Why did God incinerate people who are complainers? I shall tell you why. God did that because he loves us. God did that because he is good. It's not because he was unkind or ruthless or hateful or spiteful. God knows. He wants us to get to heaven. And he'll do whatever it takes to get our focus off ourselves and off our unpleasant circumstances and on to the only one who can do anything meaningful about it. And fire came. And this was God's way of saying, look up, don't look down. Look to me, not to yourselves. Look to God and not those unpleasant things that you don't like. They cried to Moses. Moses prayed. The fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Taberah. That means burning. You don't even need to be a scholar to know that. Because the fire of the Lord burned among them. That's what happened. And so we come down and what do you read? You read some amazing things. I'm losing my monitor. I don't know if that was planned or not, but it was disquieting. And you read in Numbers chapter 11 and, 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 and verse, we'll find it. Oh my goodness. Verse, man. The mixed multitude, at least we can blame them. They fell a lusting. And the children of Israel caught the disease. And they wept again and said, who will give us flesh to eat? Here they were on their vegetarian diet that God had them on, preparing them for the promised land. I see a parallel. I hope you do too. We remember the fish which, the Lord, which we did eat in Egypt freely. And then they spoke about the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. And now our soul has dried away. Listen to this. This is one of the most staggering statements that you read in the whole Bible. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Can you imagine that? It was their lifeline. And they were saying, we got nothing to eat, except, of course, for this which is given to keep us alive. <laughs> Isn't it remarkable some of the things that we complain about? You complain about the pastor. Thank God you have one. I mean, in most cases, thank God you have one. You complain about your spouse. You're lucky to have her, man. How spoiled for choice were you back in the day? The things we complain about. You complain about your kids. Ah, what if you didn't have any? You complain about that. And here they were complaining about the greatest blessing that God was giving to them, other than the gift of life, and this was sustaining life. They complain, and God describes the manna and so on. And then Moses in verse 10 hears the people weep. They're complaining. Moses was unhappy, and he cries out to God. He said, why are you doing this to me? Why have I not found favor in your sight? You are laying the burden of all of the people upon me. It was Moses' turn. Have I? Did I give birth to these people? Have I begotten them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nursing, nursing father beareth the suckling child? 
man, how am I going to find food? There are too many people. It's too heavy. If you deal with it with me like this, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand. If I have found favor in your sight. Can you imagine praying that prayer? Well, the Lord said to Moses, get 70 men of the elders of Israel. People you know to be the elders of the people, officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the spirit that is upon thee, and I will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that you will bear it not thyself alone. God promised something great was going to take place, and he demonstrated to Moses that he was with Moses at every step in that journey. But let's drop down here. They talk about the meat, that God's going to provide it for them somehow. Verse 24, we're narrowing in on our point here. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him and took of the spirit that was upon him, that is, that was upon Moses, and gave it to the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, and they did not cease, which is interesting because most every other translation of the Bible says they prophesied, and that was it. They were one and done. They stopped prophesying, and they prophesied so no more. So you can work that one out in your own time. So this was a blessing. There's a number of things that we could deduce from this. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this, church member. Let me tell you this, Christian friend. There are times when you look around and, and you are going to be convinced that you have just cause to complain. You are convinced that the church is going to hell because of what you see in your little corner of the world. You are convinced that everybody's mad except you, and when you have those thoughts, it's probably good to double check. <laughs> you are convinced that it's not like it was in the good old days, and it may well be that it's not. But I want you to, dem to, to see what God demonstrates here in the Bible. Moses hears them complaining, and they are complaining. And he's done with carrying the burden. And he goes to God and cries out. And what does God do? In the midst of his distress, in the midst of his discouragement, God pours out his Holy Spirit in a marked way, in an unusual way, in a meaningful way. And God is saying to Moses, Hey, Moses, I am in the middle of this thing. This is still my people. You don't have to like what you see. You don't have to agree with everything that's going on. But it's my people. And if you want to transpose that to another key, God would be saying to you today, you may not like everything that you see, but it is still my church. I believe that. If I didn't believe it, I would leave. This is still God's church, and it don't matter where on the color palette you color yourself. You can hear people next to you, nearby you, belly aching like nobody's business. Listen, if we simply coveted to get our noses down and our tails up and put our shoulders to the grindstone, it would be business unusual. We would see a flurry of soul winning activity like we've never seen before. And I want to point out something here that I think is crucial. They prophesied and they either did cease or they didn't cease depending on which version of the Bible you are reading. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other was Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. They were of them that were written but went not out unto the tabernacle. And they prophesied back in the camp. Moses called 70. For some reason, 68 came. These two fellows were detained or they didn't get the message or something, and they prophesied back there. And then a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. We don't know what tone of voice he was using. We simply know that he was reporting the facts. And of all people, Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses number two, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. 
And Moses, as we're going to read in just a moment, did not want to do that. In fact, let me read that verse. I'll make this point, and then I'll double back around and make another one. Moses said to him, Envious thou for my sake. Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Now there's, I think, at least two points that we can make here. Number one is this. If you have anything to do with the work, it is not your role to limit the activity of others. Of course, you want to provide guidance. It was, I find it interesting. We're in a place here where there's a lot of people representing supporting ministries. And yet you can go to some parts of the field and you define the field. And you can discover that among leadership, there is no love for supporting ministries. You know, that attitude has got to be an abomination in the sight of God. It just has to be. As though there's any group of leaders who can actually get the work done all by themselves. It's madness. What God is saying here is, don't envy because there's somebody not in your direct um, jurisdiction who's getting on and doing the work. Don't do that. Thank God for what God is doing wherever God is getting it done. Wherever he's getting it done. We don't need less El dad and less me dad, we need more. We need more people in more places who are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Can you say amen? I know you can. We need more. We need more people raising up. Now, now I, I don't want you to take my remarks out of context. Obviously, we, we are all part of a whole and we need to plug into that whole and understand where we fit into that whole. Understand that unity in the church is absolutely essential. But God isn't bound by our boundaries. And God wants to work in unusual ways. This was unusual, so unusual that Joshua said, we got to put a stop to that. But Moses, as wise as he was, said, no, you don't want to put a stop to that. And I want you now to notice what Moses said. He said, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. You know what Moses was praying for? He was praying for business unusual. Moses knew. Here we have 68 and me, 69, two over there who are prophesying. What about the others? What about the others? What if God had so many people in such a powerful way that his spirit did something the likes of which we have never seen before? Can you imagine it? Listen, if we go on the way we're going on with a few people active, and a bunch of people who are just spectators. If we go on with churches where people come merely for the performance and not to plug in and be active, if we continue to educate people that church members are consumers and the, I'm going to use the word clergy, the clergy, because I think it fits the concept, the clergy are the producers, we are going to be wandering in the wilderness for another thousand years. It's God's plan to pour out his spirit on everybody so that everybody takes her or his meaningful place in the front lines of the work, sharing one's faith. And this is what I love about the church. There are places where people clamor for office. They want to be the, the pastor or the senior pastor or the elder or the head elder or the deaconess or the head deaconess or the choir leader or whatever it is. And there are people, some of them, who get a little miffed when they don't get to be what they want to be. Well, here's the wonderful thing. The highest you can climb in church is sharing your faith with somebody else. That's the highest you can climb. And you don't need anybody's permission to do that. You don't need a permission, to, you don't need a position to do that. You can share your faith wherever you are at any time, day or night. You have God's permission. Moses said, would God that he would pour out his spirit on everybody. And the fact of the matter is, God wants to pour out his Holy Spirit. He has said, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Moses knew business unusual. It's not better plans, although better plans are great. It's not more workers on the payroll, although that may be a blessing too. It's not better programs, although better programs never hurt nobody. It is more of God's Holy Spirit coursing through the veins of the church, coursing through the veins of church members. It is people on fire for God. 
whose primary urge, whose number one priority is sharing Christ when they can, any place they can, because we know Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. And what's the next word? And then shall the end come. That's when. And as long as we sit around like bumps on a log, the work won't ever get done. Except my last statement, of course, doesn't take into account that God has a plan. God's going to get the work done. You know what I read someplace? I read that the Holy Spirit is going to fall down in such great measure, in such great measure, that many people are going to look around and see this outpouring of the Holy Spirit and call it fanaticism. Can you imagine what that looks like? Can you imagine being part of that? Can you imagine? You know, God wants to see the church rise up and do something different. That's my statement. You can check the validity of that. And I think that's true because I've read what you all have read in the Bible about the gospel going to earth's remotest bounds. We haven't done that yet. And it's not just that God wants to see the gospel go to earth's remotest bounds. If we really believe that that's what God wanted, we'd crank up the printing presses and send a great controversy and a set of Bible studies, uh, it is written Bible studies, to everybody in the world. <laughs> we just have a great big uh, offering and then mail them out and we'll say, that's it, the gospel's gone to the world. But you know that that's not exactly what God's asking. We could mail them all DVDs. There it is, the gospel's gone to the world. If we really believed, that's what God was trying to get done. Bible studies, DVDs, that's it, Jesus is coming back. But we know there's more to it than that. I was really fascinated to read that in uh, Nebraska, about five miles from Union College, scientists at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln produced, I believe this was last year, might have been this year, a flash of light or a beam of light that was, let me read it, I wrote it down here, one billion times brighter than the surface of the sun. I wonder how they did that. Now, now it only lasted for 30 billionths of a millionth of a second, but still that's a really bright light. And when we talk about light, we know how vital light is. First day of creation, what did Jesus say? Let there be. And Jesus is the light of the world. Now we know that. But the plot thickens when we listen to Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. That's when the plot thickens. Jesus never said, you are the preacher of the world. Although I'll be the last one to say, let's sack all the preachers. I'm in favor of preachers. But he said, you are the light of the world. He didn't even say, you are the Bible study of the world. Although we know that sharing the word of God is sharing light. It was David who wrote, the entrance of your word gives light. God's word is a lamp to our feet and a, tell me, a light to our path. God is calling for business unusual. We just can't go on doing exactly what we've done the the same way, now see, when I say the same way, that then calls our methods into question, and our methods have got us this far. It's not the message or the method, it's the messenger. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. The prophet Isaiah wrote this, behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And when you get down to Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1, you read that God's Spirit is poured out into His people with such amazing power that the earth is lit up with a manifestation of the glory of God. That's the fourth angel's message. The earth lit up by God's Spirit shining out of God's people. My friend, I would say to you, that is business unusual. It seems to me, of course, there are plenty of people committed to that ideal, but so many that are not. So many 
that are not. And this is why the shaking will come and tribe after tribe will go out and company after company will come in. And then we'll have a people that are radiant. I'm not, I'm not angling for that day, but it's going to take place. Business unusual. Moses was there with 68 of his brothers. The Spirit of God was poured out. Two more over there in the camp. Not right there with Moses and the boys. Ah, oh, there's a problem. Moses said, no problem. We need more of that, not less. We need more of God's Spirit being poured out, not less. We need more people being raised up by God under the unction of the Holy Spirit of God, not less, not less. The world must see in God's people a revelation of the character of God. It must. You can imagine then, can't you, if we, if we possess Christ in our hearts by faith and then we share the Word of God. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine sitting down with a Bible study and God's Spirit has you? It's no guarantee, but it makes this book irresistible when God has you and you indeed are the light of the world. Not just talking about it, not thinking about it, not hoping for it, but experiencing it. Business unusual. It has to be the missing link. It has to be. Our doctrine is solid. Sorry if you don't like it, it's solid. Sorry if you are busy finding fault with it, it's you who's wrong, not the church. It's solid. So it's not the doctrine that's the problem. Is it the methods that the, we simply haven't come up with a new program? E.M. Bounds said, the church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. We just came back from Manila. We led a team of 41 on an It Is Written mission trip. It was fantastic. Three and a half thousand people were baptized. That's credit to the work of the church in Manila. Uh, Central Luzon Conference. It's fantastic. I'm standing in the pool baptizing people just this last Sabbath. And as they come to me, I'd never seen so many pastors in a pool baptizing at one time. And as they would come to me, I would say to them, how did you hear about God? And person after person, I would like to tell you everyone, not everyone, only 90% or so. 90% of them said, my friend told me. My friend invited me. I said, did you come to the meetings? Yes. How long have you been coming to the church? 10 years. <laughs> I said, what took you so long? She said, well, you know, I just was never ready, but, but now I'm ready, and I'm just so glad to be getting baptized today. I said, how did it begin? She said, my friend asked me. My friend. You know, here in the United States, we talk about the Philippines. We talk about places like Peru as though they're aberrations. Well, they are, in as much as people are willing to share their faith. Of course, it's not one world, and one field is different, and another field is different. Understand that. But can you imagine if everybody in your church, including you, was praying and looking for ways 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to share Jesus with others? Would it change things? Man, it would change things. It would be business unusual. Unfortunately, we're, 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 we're too often like the squid. That you could, about 20 million people have watched this on YouTube. In a restaurant, somebody gets served a bowl of food and a squid is on top of it. It's a dead squid, of course. Now, I never have figured out why anybody wants to eat squid. I tried octopus once, and uh, not lately. Uh, and I would, have, I would have been better off chewing on my rubber boot. It was just terrible stuff. And so the person reaches for the soy sauce. Now, the, 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 what is it? I said it was a squid. The squid is there, looking squid-like, just sitting on the, on the food. And the person, the diner, you, you ought to look at this. It'll creep you out. The diner takes the soy sauce and sprinkles soy sauce on it, and the squid comes to life. It looks like one of these, one of these boys on a cardboard on the street breakdancing. It is just all over, like Michael Flatley. It's just, it's river dance on the plate. There's a lot of activity in that bowl, but the squid is dead. And I wonder if far too often we don't confuse activity and life. Jesus told us, you are to be the light of the world. That can only happen one way, as Christ pours his spirit out, as we yield to that and pray, Lord, fill me up, fill me up. 
If we got 100% of the people in church praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, business unusual. Yes, we ought to plan bigger. We ought to strategize. Plan. Get your brightest minds. Come up with better resources and products and think about the technology and the times. Of course. But without the Holy Spirit of God, it's just business as usual. Same song, different verse. That's all it is. We are standing as close to the edge of eternity as we want. The X factor, of course, is God's timetable and what God is going to do. But we are standing as close to the coming of Christ as we wish. If you want to be filled up with the Holy Spirit of God, you can be today, tonight. You may be. And you may receive more tomorrow, no matter who you are, where you're from, what your background, what your educational level or your attainments in this world. And God would use all of us, every one of us, in the most powerful way. Business unusual. I think it's time. And if the Holy Spirit has us, if Eldad and Medad rise up and we don't try and push them down, and if there are more Eldads and more Medads who are prophesying in the camp or wherever it is they are because they're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's a new day. Thank God this is not a mystery. Thank God it's not unattainable. He's not asking us to climb the highest mountain. Simply yield and let Christ fill us and let his spirit empower us and let the power of heaven remake us and then use us in incredible ways. God will do it. The work will be done. You know, some time ago, Alexander Graham Bell had a vision. I don't mean a vision, a, a, a dream. He said, I have heard articulate speech produced by sunlight. I've heard a ray of the sun laugh and cough and sing. What Alexander Graham Bell had done with the telephone, he believed could be done with the photophone. He said, you ought to be able to send a message with light. And now with fiber optics, that's exactly what happens. Your text message goes to a receiving station, let's call it. That electromagnetic wave is converted to light. And then along with millions of messages, it travels across the Pacific Ocean, let's say to China from where we are here. Some messages getting off along the way. The process is converted at the other end and it happens in one twentieth of a second. Because your message is sent as light. We have a wonderful message. Here it is, the three angels' messages. Sell it, never. Keep it, always. Love it, share it. But I tell you something, when it goes forward as light, the message will be accompanied by a power the likes of which we have never seen. Let us pray tonight that God would have us and use us and pour out his spirit upon us and that as Jesus wished, we truly would be the light of the world. Let us pray. Our Father, it's too late in the history of the earth for anything else. Grant that we, your people, would be moved by your spirit. Grant that we would make ourselves available. Just keep working at us. Keep speaking to us. Work away. Call to us. Hound us if you must. Bring us to the place where we would yield and focus on the main thing, not complaining about the matter. Prayer. That's all I'm asking you to pray. A prayer that says, Lord, let me be the light of the world. Fill me with your spirit. Would you raise your hand with me? Only God is watching. You don't have to. But if you would raise your hand, you would be, you would be acting on a prayer that says, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Heavenly Father, let it be business unusual. We pray. We accept. We receive. And we believe in Jesus' name, please say.